Oh, what is my life? I <laughs> have no idea. Um, perhaps, Matt, you could explain. <laughs> well, we have our little chat before um, we go to, go to air. Okay, here we go. It's time for Tech Talk. Um, and I've got to switch everything off so he can hear his introduction. So away, wait, I've got to organise it first. Uh, away we go. It's time now for the latest news on what's hot and what's not in the world of technology with Matthew Dickerson on Tech Talk. Here on TCFM 88.9. Morning, Matthew. How are you? Uh, I sound like a prima donna, don't I? The <laughs> contract obviously states the contract between ourselves and TCFM. The, uh, the play that uh, little tech talk intro must be played every time, and I must hear it apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you started it. I'm not taking any blame for that at all. Um, mate, some incredible stories this week, and thank you for them. Now, this one is ideal. I reckon it's a beauty, actually. How we're going to patrol our wonderful island in the future and keep our waters safe. Go. Bob the Blue Bottle. Bob if, the Blue if Bottle. If you need a name for someone that is going to be out in the water bobbing around, I'm sure there was some, it was an Aussie invention, this little boat, and I'm sure they sat around a, a pub one night when they basically got this thing ready to go, we better give it a name, and of course it's going to be bobbing around the water, so Bob, Bob was the obvious name. Yeah. So what it does is it sits out there in the, in the ocean, it's got solar Pa uh, panels on it, so it's got electricity generated on there. It's got a sail, and the sail is actually made up of a solar panel, and it's obviously got wind and wave hitting it as well. So it uses all that to give it enough power to basically just patrol the waters. It's sitting out there 24 hours a day, keeping an eye out for activity, things that might look a little bit unusual, a little bit strange, and it's feeding the information back to shore, obviously, and it's just continually feeding that through. But if it works out through its artificial intelligence that something's happening out in the ocean that maybe isn't quite right, maybe a boat that doesn't look quite right, something that's not reported, some uh, you know activity that seems like it needs to be investigated further, then the Defence Forces is uh, alerted or the Border Patrol is alerted and they send out some real humans in a real boat to have a look at it. So it's a great way, because we've got a pretty big coastline, it's a great way to keep our coastline protected. 36,000 kilometres. Mate, um, two questions. Will it stand up to a cyclone? They actually talk about the fact that it continually record weather conditions and it can actually go into a cyclone. Now, I don't know how well it will survive through a cyclone, but they did talk about it recording weather conditions during a cyclone. So presumably, it can handle some fairly tough conditions. All right, so the Indonesian fishing boat sees one, the boys line up with their busted down 303s and shoot it. Um, can it withstand that sort of treatment? No, that's no. probably the, the, the one failure there. It's going to record someone shooting attacking it, it shooting it. It's, <laughs> going to, it's going to have all that camera footage and it's going to be sending it all back to shore. So there'll be good footage of it, but it might still be sunk in that process. Yeah, right. so, but I think the bottom line here is, isn't it better to have an unmanned boat that is certainly worth a few dollars, but an unmanned boat attacked by someone that might have some uh, you know, unpure, impure motives there, mm. having that attack it rather than a real boat with real people on it. I agree. I agree. No, no I think it's, it's a wonderful idea. Yeah. That's why I made it lead story this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, um, Virgin Galactic. Want to fly around the world. Oh, this, oh, I want to do this. If it does cost $350,000, I think I'd scrape together every last penny and try to, I'd just love to do it. Well, Virgin Galactic, of course, have been talking about going up into space, and that was the, the real yeah. reason that Richard Branson started Virgin Galactic, to put people up into a, a space-like experience, not for long, but just put them up into space and say, there you go, you can experience what astronauts experience for a short period of time. But they also realise there is a market in the future, maybe not right at the moment, but mm. in the future, of getting people from A to B quite quickly. And the Concorde, of course, was very successful in its time frame and, and obviously it? it doesn't fly. Well, I think so. I think people that flew on the Concorde were very impressed by how quickly it got from A to B. I mean, you've been on the Concorde, so you know how fantastic that was. And, and that came about when air travel was still not seen as, as that luxurious. It was just a, a transport mechanism from A to B and, and Concorde kind of changed that. But he's talking about now the Virgin Galactic transporters being able to go at Mach 3, three times the speed of sound. So to give you an idea of what that would do, you can fly from one side of America to the other in about 90 minutes. And, you know, I've been on trips from one side of America to the other, and it's normally four five, or five hours. Five hours, yeah. yeah. Depending on the, the prevailing wind conditions. So 90 minutes from, from one side of America to the other, five hours from, say, New York across to London. So to get across to Europe, about five hours. So it's pretty impressive in terms of what it can do. They've put the specs together. They've signed a deal with Rolls-Royce, so they've got the engine side of it under control. 
and they're going through the certification process now to make sure they can actually do what they say they're doing. I mean, it's unlike Richard Branson to make some announcement and then go and work out how to do it. But, <laughs> but I think that's the idea. They're talking about these processes occurring. So there may be a Virgin Galactic Mac 3 plane will be something that will be used to get from A to B around the world rather than just going up in the spa into space and having a bit of a play. Yeah, I want to go into space. <laughs> I want to go into space. I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to go... At, 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 at Mac 3, but no, I want to go into space. Yeah. Now, touch screens, untouchable touch screens. So you've got your screens so you don't have dirty old fingerprints over it every more, anymore. I can do wave my hand in, to turn mine on right? In, in and wave my hand, but after that, it's it's got to be buttons. Yeah, and so this was actually started, the research was started with the University of Cambridge on a project with Jaguar, actually, where they wanted to find a, a screen in a car. The, I know it doesn't make sense, a no-touch touch screen, but a screen in a car that you could actually control through touch-like gestures without touching it. Because what they found was when you're driving a car, the car's moving around, you're trying to concentrate on the road, maybe you've got some kids in the back seat, and then trying to touch a touch screen is actually quite difficult while all that's going on, especially the movement of the car. So they came up with this concept where they wanted to have the screen where you point at it, make gestures at it, like you said in your car where you're waving in front of it, but a little bit more specific where you'll still have buttons on the screen that you can actually almost touch, but you just need to point at them. And there's some AI involved here, yeah. and there's basically a bit of machine learning, and then there's some gestures that will pick up that you're trying to point at a certain button. It will trigger that. That was the first part of the research. Then this little thing called COVID-19 came along, and they realised that what a great place for COVID-19 to spread when you've got touch screens that people go along, they're hard, smooth surfaces, they touch the screen, let's say they've got something on their hands, some virus on their hands, and then for the next 24 hours or so, that virus will still sit there on the screen. So for example, you go through a train station where you might buy tickets for the touch screen, everyone comes along and touches that screen, there might be thousands touch that screen in a day. So suddenly they realised that this no touch touch screen had some applications elsewhere, mm. COVID-19 for example. So they're actually looking to develop this same technology in touch screens that we might use in public locations. Very good. No, I think it's a good idea. I mean, after I go wave in front of my screen, I then have to talk to it <laughs> and tell it to do things. And most of the time it does them perfectly. Um, but every now and again, when I say ring Matthew Dickerson, it doesn't like Dickerson for some reason. <laughs> doesn't like your surname. <laughs> and it rings another Matthew. <laughs> but anyway, um, I sort of swear at it and um, tell it to cancel, ring Matthew Dicker song. <laughs> and that's the thing. And, I and think then that it'll do it. And, and that's the other logical thing with all of this is voice control is certainly a way to be able to touch things or, or trigger things without touching them. But in you, if you think of a, a train station, you've got a lot yeah, of noise sure. in the oh, background. Yeah. You've got a lot of different accents, a lot of different way people might be talking, a lot of different locations they might want to go to. So it's pretty hard for a computer to work out what someone's saying from all of that compared to being able to just wave in front of a touch screen. So yeah. voice will continue to be developed, but no touch touch screens, I think, will be something we'll see more of in the future. Yeah. Who said the worst place to put a, um, a uh, solar panel was on a car? Who said that? Well, another Richard Branson-like figure, Elon Musk, who likes oh, to make yeah. announcements before they're ready to be made. But this is a, a, an example where you can actually buy, there's a new car um, from Hyundai that's going to be allowed to have solar panels in the roof. And I have a lot of people talk to me about that, and they say, oh, you've got all this roof space on a car, why don't you put solar panels on a roof? And the bottom line is that it is the worst place to put solar panels because you, your car is not always parked out in the sun, yeah. but the actual area, the surface area of the roof is not that much. And so Hyundai is saying that in their car, with it's an option to put this on the roof, it will add about, get ready for it, two miles a day. That's it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm overwhelmed. Absolutely so you can, overwhelmed. You can see why it's not a great place to put it. The Prius, the Toyota Prius, I think that about 2015, brought out one with solar panels on the roof, but they said it didn't even go anywhere near touching the battery. All it was used for was to keep the air conditioning going in the car to keep some air flowing through the cabin. Yeah. So if you jump back in on a hot day, there was some air that had been flowing through and it wasn't too hot inside. So, yeah, it seems great in theory, but just the efficiency of solar panels and the, the sheer area that you need, there's just not enough space yeah. there. Um, the Cybertruck, they are talking about that with Elon Musk's uh, Tesla. The Cybertruck, they are talking about an option there for solar panels on the roof. But again, he's already said, not a great place for solar no, panels. No, um, and you can't put them on the bonnet. And you really can't put them on the top of the boot. And you can't put them on the side. And, yeah, 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 again, you, you, you're spending money on something that's not going to achieve much of an outcome. 9.30, talking with Matthew Dickerson, Tech Talk. Finally, Matthew, the, the one that really impresses me at the moment. And I don't know how this is going to work, but anyway... Um, Australia is the first country in the world to order Google and Facebook to pay for news content. Now, I agree with that entirely. 
being in this particular media, sure. and especially with regional users and regional newspapers under the pump, is it going to work? Yeah, that's a big question, isn't it? When you've got companies the size of Facebook and Google, and let's face it, they are in, in GDP, they are larger than some nations, and then you've got little old Australia here saying, oh, I know, we'll just take these big guys on and we'll knock them off. Mm. So it's the first, we're the first country that's trying this. About two and a half years ago, there was a, a report started that talked about what we should be doing. 18, oh, sorry, that went for 18 months, and then the recommendation was that we should be charging for some news content. We've talked about that for about a year. There's been some recommendations about it maybe being some sort of gentleman's agreement between the big tech giants and our news outlets. That's gone nowhere. So now they're introducing a mandatory code. Again, they haven't actually specified in the code how it will work. They've actually said to Google and Facebook and the news outlets, we want you to work it out. It's going to be mandatory. You work it out. If you come to an agreement, everything's okay. I can't see them coming to an agreement. No. You say to a company, any company, you can voluntarily pay for something and they'll say, I'll choose zero, thanks. That's my volunteer. <laughs> exactly. So I think there'll be some government legislation that has to come into play. And then the big question will be, will it go through the court process? Now, Facebook and Google might say, ah, the amount Australia wants us to pay, pittance. But there may be further implications exactly. around the rest of the world. Mm. If Australia gets away with it, then suddenly other countries, which have got much larger revenue streams for Facebook and Google, might say, well, Australia did it, so the precedent has been set, we'll go and do it now. So they might fight tooth and nail here in Australia. I think they might, and I have a feeling there's a certain president in the United States say, you beauty, <laughs> <laughs> Australia's got it, uh, let's try it on at home here. We'll jump on the coattail. Oh, yeah, you'd, you'd get right. on the train quick smart. Yeah. Good talking with you, mate. Uh, thanks, Richard. Okay, Matthew Dickerson, Tech Talk, and you'll be back next Wednesday with more great stories, no Absolutely. doubt. We'll yeah. see you then. DCFM 88.9, 28 to 10.